Hi everyone, this is Joe Rebello with Martial Arts Today Television. And we're here today at the Kaizen International Black Belt Academy in Fort Collins, Colorado. We're here for the United Martial Arts Alliance International Kenpo Ohana Camp. And we've got a great interview. We've got a great episode. We've got a great show here with Hanshi Ron Carlson, an 80-year-old martial arts practitioner who has been training for most of his natural life in various martial arts disciplines. It's a rare treat to hear this man talk about his life, career, and study of the martial arts. Stay tuned for an exciting interview and some exciting action from Hanshi Ron Carlson. We'll be right back. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen, with Martial Arts Today TV. Uh, I'm your host, Joe Rebello, and I'm here with a very special guest, a gentleman whose career I followed over the, uh, the internet for at least 20 years, a uh, man who is a legend in the art of Kenpo in this country. And we are, as we told you before, in Colorado. Uh, again, we're in Fort Collins today, and we're here interviewing Hanshi Ron Carlson. Hanchi, it's a pleasure, pleasure seeing you. you. And I have to tell you, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I remember in the uh, the early days of, uh, of, of my in introduction to the internet, always seeing you mentioned, always seeing you listed, mm -hmm. always seeing you standing there in that wonderful red and black samurai garb. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the first question I always ask all my interviewees is, how did you begin in the martial arts? Uh, I was 17 years old and uh, joined the United States Marine Corps and uh, right at the tail end of the Korean War, conflict, whatever they wanted to call it at the time. And uh, I wound up as an MP, a military policeman, doing brig duty, gate duty, this type of thing. And the brig had a compound, and we would take the prisoners, take their mattresses and put them out in the center of the compound. And then we'd go out and use them for mats. And I had people who were rotating back from Okinawa, Korea, Japan, China, wherever they stationed, and they came through our barracks and were stationed there until they were either discharged or moved to a dude. Sometimes they were there for a few days, a few weeks, maybe even months. So, and a lot of these guys were, GIs were bringing this stuff back. So as a military police, we were required to kind of do some, some defensive tactic stuff. So we, we I play with a lot of this different, these different arts and stuff from whenever I could, we just go out there and play and have the little air, the mattresses air out some more and then take, let the prisoners put them back in their cells. <laughs> wow. So that's how I got my start. When I got discharged in uh, 1957, uh, I stayed in California. I worked for Convair Aircraft for about six months, got laid off, so I came back to Denver, which is my hometown. I was born and raised there. And I, uh, there was only two martial arts schools in Denver at that time. Denver School of Judo, which was run by the Japanese community. And it was pretty, back in those days, it was hard to get in if you were not Japanese, okay? But uh, one of the kids that we went to high school with, his father was one of the head instructors, judo instructors at the school. He got us in, but we basically we were bookies. We got thrown around a lot. And this went on for, I don't know, six, eight months maybe, or whatever. And it started getting a little old, just not learning everything, but just getting beat up on all the time. Okay. So, we uh, put a, uh, I was chopping around, looking around, and my wife told me, why don't you go do something? And so, she says, well, your friend Jerry, he's a weightlifter. Why don't you go lift weight? And I said, oh, I don't want to go pump iron stuff. So, I'm driving by my old high school, Spare Bowl, and she just says, I'm an AMID of Denver. So, so I go in, and this guy in high school. And he did Shotokan in Japanese, so I started doing Shotokan. Thing. This went on for about six months, and he says, one day, oh, I says, I'm going to California for three weeks, and I'll be back. So he goes to California for three weeks, he comes back, and he says, we're going to do Chinese Kempo and started teaching the uh, forum called Hung Chao. And, uh, and then some other forums said, these forums are really rare. Uh, nobody else that I know of do the same forums that I do. And I've kept these forums that I learned all these, all these years. I've, 
tweaked them a little bit here and there, but they're pretty much the same. The only, I'm not running into a person who did, from Shaolin Kempo, who did, and they call this same form Mountain Meach River. Right, and um, for, the, for our viewers who are, are watching us uh, either through a black YouTube, uh, you may be familiar with that through the lineage of Ralph Castro and Shaolin uh, Kempo. And um, that's one of their primary forms. And actually, I just interviewed uh, uh, Eugene Cedeno a little while ago. Yeah. And he's one of the highest ranked people under Ralph Castro. And that's one of the major forms that I got to see way back at the first Gathering of Eagles. They did all their forms from white to black. Yes. But please continue. So, so, so you were training in, in Chinese Kempo, and you had learned the form Chao Hun. And um, how long were you studying with this particular instructor? Well, kind of on and off for uh, several years. Uh, this was in the early 60s. I really started formal training, dojo training, probably 1962. So, and that most of the stuff was I picked up when I was in the service in, in the Marine Corps. And I put, uh, just kept building off of that. And they, unfortunately, I'm not going to mention any names, but the person I think turned out to be a very bad person, had a lot of trouble, went to prison a few times, pop, pop, pop. In 1968, I went and uh, became a professional firefighter city county of Denver. And this lot of s stuff was going on then, and I kind of pulled back. I didn't want to be associated. I could not be associated with it. Right. There was a probation for a year or before I became a permanent and stuff. So then after, uh, again, I had a few fans and actually some of my students would actually come out to the firehouse. We'd go down the basement and train, and I'd bring my booking gear down. If we got a call, I'd jump in my boots and we'd go, and I'd say, well, keep training, and if we're not back when you're done, just make sure you shut the, lock the door on the way out, out the back door into the parking lot. So that's... Now, from from there, what were the other... Uh, so obviously, again, you weren't training with this instructor anymore. You were, you were, you were, you were teaching people uh, there. Um, well, who was your next instructor? What was the next art or, or that you got involved in? Well, it was a number of things. Uh, I did some training. Uh, I had met through uh, uh, his name is Wayne Welch, who was a, uh, he was, he claims me as his first Kempo teacher. He started in the same school about six months after I did, and I was kind of teaching some of the basic stuff. When we, and we both worked nights at that time, and so we were there during the day in the morning and stuff, and the teacher was out running around doing stuff, so this type of thing. He later moved to uh, from Colorado to uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco, where he got into learning uh, the three internal arts, Tai Chi, Xing and Bagua. So, and then he moved to Phoenix for about 10 years, and then he finally moved back to Colorado, and we hooked up again. And he had trained with, uh, Grandmaster Al Costas back then in the 60s. So and actually him and his wife had babysitted Al's kids. Oh, wow. So I've known him you know, since the 60s. And he had introduced me to uh, Wayne Welch, okay? And uh, he, his title now is Lao Shur, which means ancient teacher. So, and we're still, they, and we do put together every year what we call uh, Rocky Mountain Thunder, which is our gathering that we do every year. And uh, he put a, um, put this together and he used to do, he introduced me to uh, Willem Torres, from Sila, okay? And they met on a winter night. Uh, just, he stopped to help a person change a flat tire in a snowstorm. And they got to talk and found out martial arts interests, and that was Bella Torres. And then he introduced me to him. So I studied on and off when I could play and you know, stuff like this. And uh, there was another guy that had trained in uh, also in Shotokan and Kempo, and he put together what he called Show Kempo. So and, uh, he recognized me as a sixth on in that part at the time. Back in the early 80s. So. Now, in relationship to your study, you came up with a, uh, a very intriguing term for the particular given art that, that you do. 
um, the, concerning the aspect of the art of peace. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that? Yes. Um, actually, uh, Wayne Welch, uh, when he left his school, he turned it over to his senior, who was a gentleman by the name of Ray Tarkington. And he started calling his system uh, Kojin Lu. Okay. And I asked him, I said, what? What does that mean, or whatever? And he said, well, he said, these Chinese, they told me it means your own way, okay? And uh, one of my students, uh, James Meeks, his wife was Chinese. She looked at it and she says, I would pronounce that Gaoren Lu, okay? Which she said means the path to becoming a better person. There's, so I changed it so I wouldn't conflict with the Kojin Lu, called it Galwin Lu, the path to becoming a better human being through self-study and skill. So, and then uh, I had, I studied uh, Iaido, drawing a sword and brush writing from Sensei Michael Sullivan, who is considered one of the highest ranking non-Oriental calligraphers in the world. Yes. Yeah, it's a uh, very well renowned, very well renowned, yes. you know, the, in the art of uh, the Japanese simply usage of shodo and uh, yeah. phenomenal. Now again, I, I, we, I noticed the Kaju Kembo and uh, I've seen you wear the Kaju Kembo uh, uh, uniforms as well. How did you get involved in Kaju Kembo? Kaju Kembo, well, going back uh, to the uh, late, late 60s, 67, 68, somewhere around here. Again, the teacher went to California and he brought Al Dacascos, he brought Al Dacascos out with the purpose of opening another school. Well, they had kind of a falling out, and that's when Al Cousins went up to William Webb's school. Mm -hmm. so, so, but before that happened, they both went to uh, to Hawaii and both tested for their fifth on under C. Joe Imperato in Hawaii, and both received their fifth on, and then came back. So, and he was, uh, teacher was made head examiner for several of the western states. My former teacher was. Okay. So that's how, and, and I received a uh, fourth on in Kaja Kempo. I have one of the big old original certificates at the Wing Chun School, which I'm associated with. Excellent. So that's how I became in, in Kaja Kempo. And so we kind of kept of it and through the years. and. Now there's another aspect. Um, again, you've you've created your own organization, and, and, and uh, one in particular um, foundation that I found very interesting was the Kempo First Foundation. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Yes. Um, how did that all that come about? Can you explain to our viewers about that? Well, the Kempo First Foundation came about because I had a friend of mine who was actually uh, a formal uh, IRS agent or whatever, uh, and he was also an accountant. And he said, you need to form a, he said, you had got some tax benefits or whatever of having a nonprofit organization and uh, things. So we talked about it, uh, put this in uh, James Meeks, his wife came up with the name. He said, Kempo is uh, a way of life. So, uh, if you put Kempo first in your life, everything else will take care of itself. So it's Kempo first. So that's how we came up with the name Kempo First in the foundation, which became a nonprofit organization. Okay. So that's how that, that came about. Excellent. Um, let's backtrack a little bit for our viewers. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, William de Toiz, one of the three de Toiz brothers, uh, Paul, Victor and 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 and, and, and of course said Paul and Victor have since uh, sadly passed away. Yes. Uh, and he really is the promoter of the uh, the, the promoter of uh, Sila in Kuntao, specifically uh, uh, not only here in uh, the Colorado area but, uh, but around the world. Around the world. Right now. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, and also Al Dacascos, who uh, like I just interviewed less than 60 days ago at the Gathering of Eagles, we had a wonderful interview, and he talked about his whole experience of being in Colorado and. Uh, teaching uh, Kaju Kenbo and Wanhap Kwendo and the Chinese martial arts as well. Now, um, we're here obviously at uh, Professor Robert Austin's International mm -hmm. uh, Black Belt Academy, the Kaizen uh, 
International Blackboard Academy in Fort Collins. How did you first meet Robert Austin? How did, how did all that come about? I think that we met through uh, Uncle Bill, or one of the tourists at one of his gatherings, or in his backyard, I don't remember. We used to do a lot of training in the backyard, and, you know, <laughs> and we just kind of hit it off and became friends, and started coming up here, and he would come to some of our events and just for a number of years. So. Well, you know, I really have to uh, thank uh, Professor Austin for introducing me to you. Uh, I was very excited when I, when he first let me know, and he had to come up with that. And he, he said, you know, how's your Carlson's going to be there? I said, wow, I've been trying to meet this guy for 20 to 25 years. I'm psyched to finally get to meet him. So I was really excited about that. And um, uh, I was very honored, and uh, again, uh, at uh, a recent uh, Kempo camp that was held earlier this year, the inaugural one they ran for the, uh, the Unified, Black, uh, Unified Martial Arts Alliance International. And I was very honored to be in your company and also very honored that we, uh, to see you inducted as a, as a, a Kempo pioneer. And I was even more shocked when he had also brought me into that same company. And uh, you know, because uh, to me, you are a legacy in this country regarding martial arts, regarding Kempo and various incarnations, specifically in this area. And again, thank God for the internet. Yes. You know, more people find out about us every single day, and more people find out about you every day and everything that you do. And it was, it's a, it was great seeing you uh, demonstrate some of your skills. Now, there was another aspect that I found very intriguing. Uh, again, you, you've worked on the external arts with Kenpo, Kaiju Kenpo, etc. But you've also worked on the internal martial arts. And uh, you have a very interesting series of, uh, you have a DVD and instruction in the use of meditation and the use of uh, stones as focus on that meditation. Will you explain about that, please? Yes, uh, I was very unfortunate to get invited to a Bando monk camp where I met ah. Dr. Myung Ji, Ji okay, yes. who is the uh, pioneer, uh, head of the American Bando oh, Association, yes, which sir. is worldwide. You know, a lot of students, very very nice man, very knowledgeable, and uh, this story is not too unknown, but it's become more unknown that the first night in camp, we were sitting around the campfire and we were talking, and he asked me, he says, who was some of your teachers? And I said, oh, well, I studied with Willem de Taurus. And he goes, hmm, Taurus. He says, I know that. He says, I know that. He sits there for a minute. Oh, yes, he says, I helped liberate the Taurus family from a Japanese prison camp in Indonesia back in like 42 or, or during the war, during the Second World War. And I'm wow, you know. And uh, he told me, because he, uh, Dr. G was a jerk. Right. No. And, uh, they said that uh, he said, well, sorry, he says, when they heard we were coming, the Gurkhas were coming, the Japanese ran. And as they ran out of the prison camp, they tried to kill as many as they, they could. And it was very fortunate that they survived that. And uh, Dr. G was, he said he was 19 at the time, and Rose well, Torres was nine years old. And uh, Uncle Bell, as we referred to, we referred to him, uh, said that if it wasn't for Dr. G, he says, I wouldn't be here today. And after 50 years, I finally brought those two together and united them, and it was really a, a tearjerker. Wow. So 50 years, brought him to Colorado, and they got, you know, we had a little get together, you know, gathering or whatever, and they got to see each other after 50 years. So, incredible. And yep. at the monk camp, okay, <laughs> Dr. G tells a story because this gentleman fought in three world wars, okay. Uh, World War II, uh, Korea, and Vietnam, or whatever. He was a medic, he was a sniper, he did almost everything you could think of. And, uh, but he said he reached a point where he couldn't kill anymore. So he went back to Burma to the monastery and studied the monk side of the bandit system. There is a fighting art, but there's also the monk side, which is a nonviolent side of the martial arts. And we actually sat there in camp one day, and he said, Ron, well, he says, there's too much violence in the world, and we do not need to be adding to it as martial artists. Okay. 
and even the stuff we did with the uh, what they call the da and the double da swords or things, he says non-lethal cuts to just but not kill okay. and so this was became and i just oh man just really something and he loved my octagon my escape arts my folding arts the non-violent stuff that i was doing so we became very good friends and I went to several of his one camps when he, one of his students lived down in southern Colorado, down in Canyon City. And because we would go and meet on a Friday evening or whatever, set up camp or whatever, and then sit around and talk or whatever. And then he had a meditation camp. We'd go sit in and do a meditation before we went to bed. Get up in the, in the morning and they, he gave us a, a staff and breath beads, 60 breath beads, they call them. And you took, you know, and you've got a rhythm and silent, med walk, silent meditation walk up the mountain. Just as the sun was coming up, you reach the top and you'd sit for maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes. Silent meditation walk back down to camp and you take a break, grab some, you know what, then we start different, different training and stuff in the, from his bandit system. So. That was quite an experience. He's now, one that really made an impact on me. Now, with the meditation stones, was that one of the exercises? That yes, he introduced that one night, and he actually, I still have the stones that he personally picked out and gave me because you're not supposed to let anybody else touch them because they collect your own energy. So, wow, that's incredible. You've led such an illustrious career. You've done so much and so diversified. And we're really, ladies and gentlemen, we're only really scratching the surface of this man's career. Uh, it's, he's led a phenomenal uh, life. And uh, we've got to tell a, a quick story. We were at a particular event, and Alta Cascos was there, and he's talking about creating this organization, uh, this council, and, and what have you, of seniors. And he's naming people's ages. He said, is there any people who have been 60 and 65? And, said, and he's 70. He gets to 70. He stops because he's 75. And, yeah. and Hanshi probably goes, well, what about 80? Because you were 80 at the time. And, you know, I, I, I honestly and sincerely say that I, I can only hope and pray that, that I should be so lucky to, to be on this planet as long as you have, to be able to still be able to perform the arts as you do, to be able to still demonstrate and teach. And, and share the joys of the martial arts. And as I mentioned before, you know, it's an honor, a privilege, it's and a pleasure. pleasure. So now, before we go, we have to say, how can people contact you? You can call, our website is kempelfirst.org, and we have there, and I'm also, uh, you'll see on there, the uh, Colorado School of Wing Chun. I was fortunate, uh, this is another story, uh, there's people that, Back in the early 80s, there was only one martial arts school, and it was clear on the other side of town. And I was fortunate to get this little place, and I, we had a little dojo in the back, and I had space up front. So I called the lady that owned it, it was called Dragon Lady Martial Arts, and Martial Arts Supply. Sure. Her and her husband, she, uh, they were Japanese, okay. And uh, they later, they split or got divorced, and she kept the supply store and he kept the dojo, okay? And, but there wasn't anything on our side of town, on the west side of town, never, okay? And so I had this space, so I called her up and I said, would you be interested in maybe putting a little satellite school with supplies over it? And they'll say, you have to talk to my manager. Okay, well, who's your manager? His name is Bart Mann, okay? And so she gave me the number. I called Bart Mann and I told him who I was and what. And he says, let's meet for lunch. So we met for lunch, just hit it off, I think, put together a deal right there. They moved like that while he was manager. And unfortunately, because of uh, some of the uh, city different rules and regulations and stuff, they couldn't sell uh, like uh, shurikens or this type of, or new checks. And so it, it didn't last very long. But anyway, that's how Bart Mann and I, and we became partners and were partners in the school for 20 years. He was a professional, he was a homeopathic doctor, a uh, professional musician, drummer. Uh, he also was, worked in motorcycle industry and road and like that. And unfortunately he was killed in 2006 on a, in a motorcycle accident. And 
because of that thing, we always said that we would have a place to train. So the uh, Commonwealth School of Wing Chun is under my wing uh, foundation and still is. His senior took over, he Phil Switzer, who took that over. And uh, I still teach up there uh, one night a week or whatever. And then I teach out of the Highland Hills Judo School in uh, just a few blocks from my home. Okay, and I, on Sundays, I teach a two hour class. But I also on Saturdays, so I've been training in Wing Chun Kung Fu and also in uh, Han Chi Kaksa style of Jiu Jitsu called Dai Indo Chin, which is Japanese, Indonesian, and Chinese blend. I want you to realize this for a moment. This gentleman's 80 years old and he's still studying more martial arts, still obtaining rank, still training, still studying. Again, I hope and pray that, that I am so fortunate to be able to continue your legacy, sir. And uh, thank you so much again for your time. And we'll be back with more exciting action here with Hanshi Ron Carlson on Martial Arts Today TV. degrees to your left. Stepping back to the right, so it's going to be a right. Okay. Four angle. Five. Four angle. Five. 90 degrees. Six. Seven.
get into number one, we're going to work on basically number one angle. Here. Body alignment. Really, all I have to do is down with maybe your knee, knee back. Mm -hmm. Here. Here. Mm -hmm. Instead of using your knee, you Thank you. 
down. So if I hesitate here, he throws that other hand. That hand up so uh, I can pass. Well, there you have it. Uh, Martial Arts TV, incredible episode with Hanshi Brown Carlson. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you learned more about this person who has dedicated his entire life to the martial arts. Uh, we'd like to cite, thank the Kaizen International Black Belt Academy. We'd also like to thank Professor Robert Austin and, of course, Philip Yao, the owner and operator and chief proprietor of this wonderful facility. And let me tell you, it's a facility. If you're ever in the Colorado area, please make a point of checking it out. So that's it, folks. This is Joe Rebello, Kentbo Joe, and until next time, keep training.